Thank you. We now move to topical questions. Question number one, Alice McInnes. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what its response is to reports of Police Scotland officers routinely carrying out duties while carrying firearms. Cabinet Secretary Ken McCaskill. The decision where and when to deploy resources has always been an operational matter for the Chief Constable, who has the power to make decisions about the necessary and proportionate use of firearms. This position has not changed with the introduction of a single force. The vast majority of Scotland's police remain unarmed, but Police Scotland's dedicated firearms officers are available to protect the public 24 hours a day. Uh, they account for roughly 1.6% or, as Assistant Chief Constable Bernie Higgins has specified, 275, which includes supervisory officers, are dedicated firearms officers. These 275 officers are deployed on a shift pattern basis, and consequently, only a small number will actually be deployed across our communities at any one time. These specialist officers are able to deal quickly with urgent and unexpected threats where delays could cost lives. And while operational policing is a matter for the Chief Constable, there is a scrutiny role for the Scottish Police Authority in reporting to Parliament on an annual basis and keeping the policing of Scotland under review. Finally, post Police Scotland, there is a role for the Police Investigation and Review Commissioner, who now, as I say, has a duty if a firearm is used, as in taken out of the holder, the Chief Constable must refer the matter to the PERC, and the PERC will make an assessment and decide if a full investigation is required. Well, I think we've all read the letter, but unlike the, um, sec the Justice Secretary, I'm not reassured by the letter from ACC Higgins. Just as with so stop and search, we should be worried here in Parliament that the Justice Secretary hands the Chief Constable carte blanche. Prior to the single force, trained officers only carried firearms while responding to a clear threat to public safety and with the approval of a senior officer. And that was rightly granted on a case-by-case -case basis following an assessment of the actual risk. Now, hundreds of officers have been given blanket permission by the Chief Constable to carry guns while undertaking everyday duty. And crucially, they no longer need specific approval of a senior officer to fire those guns. The risk didn't change on the 1st of April 2013, only the Chief Constable. Is the Cabinet Secretary comfortable with the fact that the specific approval of a senior officer to carry and deploy arms, once a vital safeguard, has been removed? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, the situation that, that uh, Ms McInnes finds so uh, condemnatory that exists at the present moment was the same system that operated not simply in Tayside and Strathclyde, but also operated as at 1st March 2013, uh, prior to the inception of Police Scotland in Northern Constabulary. Uh, the Chief Constable has since now made the practice across all of Scotland, after all, a practice that was accepted by more than half of Scotland when we had the eight legacy forces. I do believe that it is necessary in the society in which we live to have officers routinely available to deal with what can be human tragedies that we have seen in other jurisdictions and sadly have also been affected by here. I think that 275 officers operating on a shift basis, where it is a small fraction of that, given that Scotland is one third of the landmass of the United Kingdom, is probably a proportionate response. And equally, I am reassured that both the SPA and indeed the Police Investigation and Review Commissioner have a role. Ms McInnes, this must be brief. Thank you. Um, this is a substantial change of direction, and this Parliament, not the Justice Committee, not local authority scrutiny bodies, nor indeed can I find any evidence that the Scottish Police Authority was notified of this. But media reports today suggest that the Cabinet Secretary knew from the start and decided to keep it quiet. So much for democracy. Can the Cabinet Secretary confirm on what date he became aware of this change in policy, and does he agree with me that Parliament should have been informed? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I've been aware of the routine deployment of firearm officers ever since I was the Shadow Justice Secretary, and indeed I saw comments when Graham Pearson was indeed the Director of the Scottish Drug Enforcement Agency before it morphed into the SCDA. So I have to say the routine use of firearms officers throughout Scotland is something that has been with us 
not simply since the establishment of this Parliament, but indeed, I think probably prior to that, although I'm not able to comment on it. I was aware that as we ran in to the establishment of Police Scotland, three forces already operated the procedure that is now the standard procedure in Scotland. Those forces actually number over half of the establishment in Scotland. They were, and I will repeat for Ms McInnes's benefit, Strathclyde, Tayside and indeed Northern. So, as I say, I was aware that as at the 1st of April, the Chief Constable was going to use the benefits to ensure that we had a similar regime across operating across all of Scotland. I have a number of members who wish to ask a supplementary of the Cabinet Secretary. Can I say the questions need to be brief and still need the answers? Um, I'll call Graham Pearson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, I'm surprised at the casual nature of the uh, Cabinet Secretary in this regard. The change is not about the number of officers. It's the, the ability for officers to patrol routinely on our streets with sidearms without the need for authorisation on each individual occasion. And that change we is need a quite question, significant. Mr. Pearson. Could the Cabinet Secretary give us an indication that he will treat this change seriously and have it reviewed? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I have no intention of having it reviewed. I am perfectly satisfied in the role of the Scottish Police Authority, the parliamentary subcommittee here. Uh, I do note, though, that it was Mr Pearson, when he was director of the Scottish Drug Enforcement Agency, uh, that did wish to change the operating procedure uh, so that he and his officers would have those powers. David, uh, David Thompson. Can the Cabinet Secretary tell us how many armed response officers are on duty at any one time in the Highlands? and who is directly responsible for them? And does he agree with me that there is nothing in principle to prevent different policies uh, on carrying of arms in different parts of Scotland? Well, uh, these are matters for the Chief Constable and indeed to be discussed at, at, at local level. As I indicated in response to Alison McInnes, the procedure operating by Police Scotland was in fact invoked by Northern Constabulary prior to the establishment of the Police Service of Scotland. And issues concerning that may be appropriately raised with uh, those who were there at that time. I cannot give the precise number. What I can say is that there are 275 authorised officers. Uh, they operate on shifts, and it is more than simply a day and night shift, so the number is significantly less than that. And clearly, they are required to operate not simply in northern Scotland, but throughout all of Scotland. So the number operating on a daily basis, Mr Finney may choose to raise either with the divisional commander or the chief constable, but I do believe it will be a number that will be sufficient to deal with any threat because, after all, the threat is as likely to occur in a rural area as it is in an urban environment. Presiding officer, could the Cabinet Secretary confirm whether the Scottish Police Authority was briefed about the new Scotland-wide firearms policy under the Single Police Force one year ago or as soon as the policy was decided? Well, the Scottish Police Authority have given, uh, I think, a comment on this. They have made it quite clear that the decision is within the responsibilities of the Chief Constable of Scotland as it relates to the deployment of officers under his direction and control. Uh, we are, they go on to say, we are aware of the public comment on this issue and have received clarification from Police Scotland. Uh, they appear to be satisfied with this, and I would suggest that if Ms Mitchell has any concerns about that, then she should take it up with Vic Emery, uh, clearly as things currently stand. And Mr Emery is satisfied with the action being taken by the Chief Constable, as I believe are the vast majority of the people of Scotland. Patrick Harvey. Thank you. This argument about the deployment of resources being an operational matter is exactly what we heard from Kenny McCaskill when Stephen House wanted all his officers armed with tasers. Why can the Cabinet Secretary not see that the move to more routine armed policing is not merely an operational matter. It's a change in the nature of our policing in Scotland, and it deserves to be held to political scrutiny. But we do not have routine armed policing. What we have is the same situation that arose prior to Police Scotland, and that probably was the situation prior to the establishment of this Parliament. Chief Constables, and in this situation now the Chief Constable of Police Scotland, I think correctly agrees that there is the risk to communities, and we have to have firearms officers 
able to be deployed. They are there. They are less than 1.6 per cent of the constabulary of Scotland on a daily basis. The number is a small fraction of that, and I believe that provides the balance to protect the people of Scotland from tragedies, great and small, with, as I say, ensuring that the public are not routinely threatened and we have no routine armed police force in Scotland. John Finney. Thank you, President Officer. Uh, was any community impact assessment undertaken in the Highlands and Islands before the decision to deploy armed response vehicle officers overtly carrying firearms to routine non-firearms related incidents in the Highlands and Islands? I can't answer that, Presiding Officer. It would be a question that Mr Finney would require to ask the former Chief Constable Mr Graham, now retired, and indeed the former board of the uh, Northern Constabulary. It may be he would wish to speak to some former members of the board. He may be acquainted with some. Uh, question number two, John Mason. Uh, thank you. To ask the Scottish Government, in light of the recent Sunday Times rich list figures showing a 19 per cent increase in the wealth of the 100 richest people in Scotland, what action it can take to narrow the gap between the rich and poor people? Cabinet Secretary John President of Scotland is a wealthy country. By population, we are the 14th wealthiest country in the OECD, wealthier than France, Germany, France, Japan and the United Kingdom. However, too many people in Scotland are not able to benefit from that wealth. Only this month, the Scottish Government published detailed analysis of UK Government data on wealth and assets in Scotland, which shows that 30 per cent of all households in Scotland have almost no wealth, meaning they do not own poverty, have a private pension or savings, or own items such as cars and household goods. Um, the Scottish Government takes uh, all action it can within its powers to ensure that we support individuals on uh, low incomes and uh, measures that we have taken in relation to the living wage and measures that we have taken in relation to welfare mitigation uh, have been designed to tackle some of the issues of poverty which have affected our citizens. Dummies. I mean, if I understand that answer correctly, really the Scottish Government has no real powers to tackle the gap between the rich and the poor. And I wonder if the Cabinet Secretary could inform the Chamber what guarantees UK ministers have given him that significant powers to tackle this gap would be devolved in the event of a no vote in September. Cabinet Secretary. Um, John Mason um, summarises the position um, in terms of the limitations of the powers of the Scottish Government. My answer was designed to say that we will do everything we can within our limited responsibilities. But the data that I put on the record in which the Government has published demonstrates quite clearly that there are significant limitations on what the Scottish Government can do in tackling a major problem which affects our society. And clearly, um, with uh, the acquisition of a broader range of responsibilities, we would be in a position to take um, a, a wider range of actions to tackle the, um, the, 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 gap, the, the inequality gap that exists between rich and poor within our society. In relation to um, the points of any implications of a no vote, Mr Mason, like I, can uh, read the comments that are made by a variety of UK politicians. Uh, but, of course, the record, um, I think, demonstrates that uh, UK ministers have been unwilling to give to this Parliament um, effective powers to tackle the, the, in the inequalities that exist within our society. And that is why we have to vote yes in the referendum in September. Mr Mason. I yeah, thank the Cabinet Secretary for that further answer. I mean, can he inform the Chamber uh, of any of the actions that an independent Scotland could take uh, to tackle this issue of inequality? Cabinet Secretary. Well, clearly there are choices to be made, uh, Presiding Officer. The, the Government has made clear in the White Paper that we would exercise a choice that uh, we would not support the continuation of uh, the investment in weapons of mass destruction and we would change the defence expenditure priorities to invest in... Um, projects and uh, measures which would boost the economic opportunities for people on lower incomes in Scottish society and to improve the participation rate within the economy. As a consequence of that, um, as we all know, uh, people active in, um, uh, in the labour market and able to um, command good jobs within the labour market are able to uh, tackle the, uh, to address the poverty with which they, they wrestle. In addition, the um, Scottish Government would be determined to use the integrated range of powers within the, um, the benefit system and the employment system to create the opportunities that can encourage more and more people to participate in the labour market and for us to be able to secure the type of higher quality employment that will enable people to work their way out of poverty. Ian Gray. 
Thank you, President. Officer, one thing the Cabinet Secretary could have done would have been to have supported living wage guarantees in the Procurement Bill a couple of weeks ago, uh, even if that meant pushing the boundaries of European law. He was willing to do that on minimum pricing for alcohol. Why would he not do it to reduce the gap between rich and poor? Cabinet Secretary. Well, the first thing to say about the living wage, of course, is that this was the first administration ever to apply the living wage across the public sector employment for which we have responsibility. And we've done that, uh, we've done that consistently since, uh, the, uh, since the government introduced that measure. Now, we, we went through the arguments with the Labour Party last week on the issues in connection with the procurement bill. Um, we set out with clearly evidenced information from the European Commission exactly why we couldn't legislate for the provision that Ian Gray has talked about. But what the Scottish Government did do was we set out a whole range of different provisions within the procurement legislation which were designed to motivate and to encourage the greatest possible degree of private sector participation in following the lead that this Government has given in the delivery of the living wage to people uh, within, the employment, uh, with, within a whole range of employment sectors within Scotland. Kevin Brown. Thank you. Does the uh, Cabinet Secretary support action on wage ratios? Cabinet Secretary. Um, yes, I do support action on wage ratios. I think the, um, the, the point that was made by Lord Hutton in his... Um, in, his ex in the review that he undertook for the United Kingdom government, um, indicated the growing disparity between um, lower income individuals and higher income individuals, and the Scottish Government agrees with the analysis that Lord Hutton set out in that respect. Thank you. Uh, that ends top goal questions. The next item of business is a debate on motion number 10079 in the name of John Swinney and the Revenue Scotland and Taxpayer Bills. Members